weakened in faith, even though he considered his own body as good as dead, because he was about a hundred years old. And even though he considered, uh, considered Sarah's womb to be dead, he did not waver in unbelief with respect to God's promise. But he grew strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. Now the statement, it was credited to him, was not written for him alone, but also for us to whom it would be credited, namely to us who believe in the one who raised our Lord Jesus from the dead. He was handed over to death because of our trespasses and was raised to life because of our justification. This is the epistle of our Lord. Hallelujah, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Hallelujah.
Jesus saying, come follow me. You see, Matthew was a tax collector. It was probably one of the occupations that was hated the most among the Jews because the Jews, as Matthew was a Jew, was collecting taxes for the Roman government, which was really the enemy. So in other words, Matthew was working for the enemy. And yet Jesus was willing not only to call him to be a disciple, but he came to Matthew's house with other tax collectors. Listen to how some people respond. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting in the tax collector's booth. He said to him, follow me. Matthew got up and followed him. As Jesus was reclining at the table in Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners were actually there too, eating with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard this, he said to them, The healthy do not need a physician, but the sick do. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. In fact, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. This is the Gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. We continue by singing the next hymn, uh, 385.
because of the length of the text, then that most of it is included in the message I will not read it at this time. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Dear friends in Christ, one of the more popular animated movies in the last uh, decade is Kung Fu Panda. In the original movie, Po Ping is on a quest for inner peace. I recently read an article that America's new pastime is not baseball, shopping, uh, not uh, video games, or even watching TV. It is the quest or longing for peace. This is the truth, first truth that we will impact today. Humans long for peace. This isn't something new. For Paul lived when philosophy was popular. All these different thoughts and beliefs produced ideas of how one could be at peace. The phrase, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you may die, is associated with the philosopher Epicurus, who promoted the philosophy of having peace by living in the moment. Throughout the centuries, humans have learned for, uh, long for peace. We can no, look no further than the country in which we live. Americans make up 5% of the world's population, and yet they consume 80% of the world's opiates. They are, there are enough prescriptions for uh, Percocet and Vicodin alone that each one of us could have 69 pills per year. We live in a country where drug and alcohol policies are consuming abundant time and energy. America is known for having a higher consumption of uh, alcohol, marijuana, and potent drugs than any other nation on earth. Why? Well, often, sadly, it is not just to alleviate real pain from a physical ailment, but to cope with emotional pain and to find peace. Many have us mistakenly associated this simply with being numb. They use alcohol or drugs to forget their troubles for a, a brief moment to give them peace. Human beings long for peace, and that is why American citizens have the highest credit card debt of any one in the world, any nation in the world. That credit card debt averages $16,000 per person. That's credit card debt, not student loans, not mortgage debt, not car debt, but credit cards with at least 20% interest. Why? Because Americans have bought into this idea that peace comes from happiness and happiness comes from objects or material possessions. Humans long for peace. What about you? It is a timeless truth that humans long for peace. But do you have it? Are you more like the panda who's banging his head in, uh, uh, against the board in search of inner peace and just can't uh, find it because the conditions are difficult? Or are you a person that truly has it? As we continue our sermon series, Vintage, we'll look at the theme, peace. I want you to think of someone who truly has peace. Why do they have it? When you look at them, why do you say that that person is really at peace? That's the answer that I want you to have by the end of this message today. That's the answer Paul wants us to find in this vintage edition of Scripture, because people long for peace. Sadly, another timeless truth is valid and real. In this world, people are looking for peace in all the wrong places. I have described some of those wrong places uh, just a little while ago. And we see it with Paul with the panda, inner peace, meditation, going on a quest. You will get it, uh, get there eventually, some people pay, uh, say. Self-talk and uh, talk shows and self-help books that will try to guide you to peace. But Paul wants you to understand that lasting peace is possible, but not if your search begins with you and not if you are searching in the wrong places. Here are some of the reminders that we need to know before we pursue lasting peace. Because if you think you can attain it on your own, if you think you have all the answers, then you need to remember what Paul says in our text. He expresses these three timely truths. While we were still helpless, while we were still sinners, 
while we were enemies. But it's what Paul wants us to understand. It's timeless when it comes to our quest for lasting peace. You and I won't find it within ourselves. We will not stumble across it on some crazy quest by meditating very hard, by withdrawing from the world, or going up to a mountain. Because Paul tells us that by ourselves we are powerless. By nature, spiritually speaking, there is no possibility for peace because we are born enemies of God. Our sinful natures cause more than just tension. There is actually hostility. God, We are enemies of God because we are sinners. Paul may have wanted to take the Romans back to uh, the words of Jesus. The night before he bled, everything was about to change. When events would unravel for his disciples, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. Jesus told his disciples that he would give them peace. What he offers and gives to us is different than what the world offers. The world offers you a quick release and numbness through self-medication, not lasting peace. That's, that type of peace is momentary and fleeting. And the truth is that when you become sober or lucid, the problems are still there. The fake peace that the world has to offer states that it will get better. If you just and look forward to what's coming. And don't worry about what's at the present. You can be at peace. If you believe that you will find happiness in objects, the world says, buy more, get more, and live more. Jobs fade. Money can easily disappear. And health can deteriorate. But this is not the lasting peace that Jesus wants you to have. So if you have bought into the devil's lies or you are consumed that I, by the idea that peace is found in alcohol, drugs, or goods, then what God has to say today is timeless and life-changing. Here's a vintage statement that you have, maybe have seen before. If Jesus isn't in your life, then there's no Jesus and no peace. Jesus does not give you the same peace that the world gives you. This is what Jesus was saying in John 14. It's either what the world has to offer or what Jesus has to offer. Remember that person you visualize who is at peace? More than likely that person is a Christian. I'm not saying that Christians don't have struggles. But when you know someone that has peace, you can see it externally because Jesus is in them internally. You all know a spouse a relative or a friend that doesn't believe in Jesus and is struggling in their faith. And they don't seem to have much peace in their life. When we look at peace, for peace in all the wrong places, we won't find it. Those, impossible, uh, those words, helpless, sinners, and enemies, uh, remind us that peace is impossible on our own. And that amazingly, uh, other words are connected uh, in Romans chapter 5. He says, for at the appointed time, that's God's perfect, unde uh, determined time. While we were still helpless, God died for the ungodly. That's you and me and all people on earth. But God shows his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, despite how sinful we are, God, Christ, died for us. Therefore, since we have been justified, that means declared innocent by Christ's sacrifice on the cross, by his blood, it is even more certain that, that we will be saved from God's wrath through him. Our sins have been paid for. But can we really have peace with God? What you deserve, the wages of sin is death, is not what, what, what you will receive because of Jesus. For if, while we were sinners, we were reconciled to God uh, <clears throat> by the death of his Son, it is even more certain that since we have been reconciled, we will be saved by his life. Deep inner peace is possible spiritually. Here is the truth. When we know Jesus, when you know Jesus, then you will know peace. When you know that Jesus died on the cross, when you know what, that he did that in spite of what you were and the condition in which you were in, when you know Jesus, 
when then the, that the Son of God came down to earth for his enemies, the ungodly and sinners, so that peace might be restored, then you will know that you are declared righteous with God. That is all you need to know to have peace. The world has made millions from, uh, from books that help people uh, pursue peace. In record numbers, the Americans are spending money to attain peace and to find it in places and in medication. And Jesus says, what I give, uh, what I give you and have won for you requires nothing of you. I have done it all. If you know Jesus, you know peace. Romans chapters 1 and th uh, through 4 are uh, stage setting chapters about sin and grace. And chapter 5 through 8 are application chapters about these principles. And that is why Paul began this uh, section with the connector, therefore. Since you have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him, we also have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice confidently on the basis of our hope for the glory of God. I have peace because my sins have been forgiven. My eternity is certain and secure because Jesus provided it for me. Not anything that I have done, but what He has done. I have peace. When I wonder and I question whether a certain distressing sin is forgivable, the answer is yes, because of Jesus. He atoned for every last sin you did me, even the pet sins that we wrestle with and succumb to. When we run back to God in contrite and repentant hearts, we are forgiven and we know peace. Through Jesus, we gain access to to God. We have peace because we know that our access to God has been restored. Even more so, I have eternal access to God and I will spend it with Him in heaven. I rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. For Christian hope is far superior to the hopes and dreams that you may have for the future. For the Christian, the certain hope of heaven gives us true peace. But you are sitting there and probably thinking, I know, I know, I know this pastor. I, I, I've heard, it, it, it's very simple. I've heard this when I was five years old and again and again in catechism class and it seems like you preach it every week. And you know Jesus, you know peace. I get it, I hear you. But that's the challenge, isn't it? Help knowledge sadly sometimes disconnects from my life. God wants us to have more inner peace, more than head knowledge, that you and I and God are good. He wants us to have a deep-seated, lasting peace that transforms us, overwhelms us, and uh, guards our hearts and minds inside and out. If you know Jesus, then not only do you know peace, but you will display that peace in your life. It will become apparent in the way you live and the circumstances. But you may be thinking, I'm not buying what you're selling, Pastor, you, because have you seen my life? Do you know what happened last week when the car broke down? Do you know the relationship struggles that I'm having with my child or my spouse and how much strife is taking place in my home? There is no peace. Pastor, can you, how can you tell me that I can have peace on the inside and the outside when the doctor told me about a chronic disease that I have and that there's going to be a lot of suffering and pain. Those real troubles are also what Paul was writing about. Paul was writing to people who also lost loved ones, who had health uh, problems and financial difficulties, and who were dealing with relationship issues. No, you have peace, eternal peace with God, on the inside and the out, because of his sacrifice. It is what I want you to remember in these in the, in the verses of our text. Not only this, but we also rejoice confidently in our sufferings. We delight in our problems, our challenges, our difficulties, according to Psalm 46, which states, We will not fear when the earth resolves and when the mountains tumble into the heart of the sea, because we know that suffering produces patient endurance, and patient endurance produces tested character, and tested character produces hope. And hope will not put us to shame because God's love 
has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Paul is talking about spiritual peace inside and out, lived in every moment. And that depends on your attitude, as we heard in our readings for today, and what you are focusing on. So here is the last timeless statement. When you know your status, not your circumstances, you will know peace. When you focus on your status and you don't get it consumed by the circumstances, when you understand your status as a child of God, that you are loved, redeemed, and reconciled, then you won't be overwhelmed by your circumstances. Then you will know and have peace in those circumstances. You see, the biggest reality test for peace are suffering and the moments that you aren't in control. Have you ever seen people that seem to have it all together and they lose it then in a certain situation and become upset? And do you know why that, that they lose uh, peace in those moments? That they don't, uh, they don't like it when they can't be the puppet master of their life and be in control. So Satan works hard during those sufferings. But you know what the devil can't do? He can't undo the peace that Jesus won on the cross. He can't undo uh, the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus defeated him, and he paid for our sins once and for all. Satan can't undo that justification or reconciliation. He can't. He can't change the impact of the cross and of the empty tomb. But you know what Satan can do? He can use the world in your mind to rob you of its impact, its joys, and convince you and I that it isn't real. And when you endure suffering, when the bills mount, when your health declines, when he knocks on the door of your heart and says, does God really love you? Are you really at peace with him? Are you sure about your status? Because a child of God would never have to go so through things like that. It's then that we can know that we have peace because of Jesus. Then Paul says, no, your status is certain. Your circumstances on earth are always changing and you will face suffering. In fact, you can rejoice in them when you see them through the lens as a child of God. For your sufferings produce perseverance. And when suffering, do you know what happens when you stop playing puppet master with your life and you let God be in control? That godly character is on display. And when you are dealing with difficulties and you say, I don't have all the answers, and I'll turn to you, that's godly character. And it says, nothing will be able to separate me from the love of Jesus Christ, uh, from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Patient endurance produces uh, character. Jesus said, in this world you're going to have trouble. But be courageous, I have overcome the world. I will persevere not only because I have the hope of God's glory, but I can also rejoice in my trials. For character produces hope, Christian hope, real hope. And that reinforces the lasting peace, since the devil can't rob me of what Jesus has won for me. That's done, that's certain, and that's my status. So please don't understand how difficult this is. I know how difficult this is. Ask my wife when we need to spend money on a large purchase. It's hard. I know when cars break down. I understand. I know that at times that there are questions that I wrestle with and you struggle with. How could God really love me when he sees me? Satan will knock hard on your heart and say, you can't have peace. But God says no internally and externally and spiritually every day. You can have peace because you know what your status is. You are a loved, redeemed child of God. God showed his love for you in this. While you were still sinners, while you were dead in his enemy, Christ died for you. And that's why these words from the Apostle Paul in Philippians are so uh, cherished. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Tell Him about your struggles and pray to Him. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Bring your requests to God. Lay them on His heart. Stop playing puppet master in your life. Celebrate your status and let God be in control. 
that peace of God, that peace that he gives, which surpasses our understanding, the peace that, that goes beyond you, because it is God's gift to you, that peace will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So here's the challenge. I really want us to be a church that other people look at and say, they know something that I don't. They live differently than I do. What is it that they know and that they have that is driving them to live that way? When all is crumbling around them, it's okay. I want that. It doesn't happen by pounding your head against the board. This peace that God gives us and our redeemed status happens when we open God's book or an app to read His Word. Instead of looking for peace in all the wrong places, we go to the one place where we are always reminded of God's love by digging into His Word and reminded of His peace. May God bless us to be a church that doesn't look at circumstances during the difficult times in our life but finds hope in our sufferings because we know that we will, uh, we will produce perseverance and character and that will drive us back to hope. And the hope of the glory of God is ours because in that there is true peace now and forever. Amen. And may the peace that passes all human understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand and we'll say together the Nicene Creed that's on the screen or on page 31 in your pen. We say the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and he became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in the unity of the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may
Keep all my family in the true faith in Jesus, so that we may spend eternity together in heaven. For Jesus' sake, amen. We join together in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. We continue with the Communion Liturgy on page 33 in the front of your hymn. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. He sends the Holy Spirit to testify that we are his children and to strengthen us when we are weak. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever.
Take eat. This is the true body. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given unto death for all of your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Poured out for you the forgiveness of all your sins. Take and drink. May you receive of Christ's true body and his holy precious blood. Assure you that all your sins are forgiven, that he loves you dearly, wants you to have faith and peace. And joy in the eternal happiness of heaven. The peace of God be with you. In a short while, we will sing the communion hymn on yeah. uh, the street.
Please stand. In response to the blessings of the Lord's Supper, we sing, Thank the Lord, on page 36.
Move to sound. Um, and uh, thanks to James Clark who uh, bought the, the, some flowers that you may have noticed in the entrance of the church. Uh, the um, I didn't put in here, I should have, I suppose, a reminder. Karen and I are going to go on vacation a little bit for a few days. We'll be back on Friday. Uh, call my cell phone if you need to uh, get in touch with me. Uh, otherwise, call um, President Tim Mulchance or one of the trustees or that if you need to get into the building. Uh, today is the last was the day to turn it in. If you have one at home and you forgot, then and then we print it next week. Um, but we are, are uh, trying to get those uh, uh, submitted and then write one check to um, the organization who will be getting. Um, are we uh, going to assemble uh, uh, the crew with uh, uh, that this week, or you can wait till next week? I don't know. We can ask for that. Otherwise, it takes a little bit of. I know it's Father's Day, so maybe you can wait till next week. Uh, uh, you know, we can do that way. Um, putting them into the, uh, the rules. I don't really have anything else. Um, any announcements from the group? Other than problems? Okay. Um, I'll leave you and uh, know that you have peace with God because of Jesus Christ, His love.